Well, what do we have here? Look at that old Gen 2 polished exhaust. Look at all this chrome. What is this thing? Well, this is a Generation 1 Hayabusa. It's owned by a good friend of mine, good friend of Brock's performance, Scott Sullivan. He's a custom, in, he's a custom painter, specializes in cars, but does his own bikes. Um, the bike's beautiful. He's ha been having some problems with it uh, recently. It doesn't want to run right. He's given me a sort of a little list of problems and in keeping with our promise to you guys that we were going to go into more troubleshooting and details on how to uh, isolate, troubleshoot, isolate, and repair problems. I thought this was a good one to start with. Now, I've already had this bike apart. I've done a couple other things to it, but I decided to put it back together so we could do this the right way and let you come along with me while I try to troubleshoot some of his issues. We're going to do that right now. And off we go. All right, everybody. I have not ridden a Gen 1 Hayabusa in a very long time. And I tell you what, if you've never ridden one of these bikes, if you get an opportunity to, it's just a lot of fun. This is a, oh, holy cow, 22-year-old motorcycle with 24,000 miles on the odometer. And I promise you, if you are <laughs> any type of performance oriented motorcycle enthusiast all you have to do is grab a handful of gas on a boot on any Hayabusa even the old ones and it puts a smile on your face so why are we here well we are going to troubleshoot some issues the owner Scott Sullivan if you look up Carcraft magazine he's had lots of bikes on the cover he's a hell of an artist hell of a painter amazing fabricator basically he can he can do pretty much anything I mean it guy builds beautiful you know cars from piles of crap in his garage floor that would just blow you away but for some reason <laughs> and I've seen this on a lot of different professions he didn't want to he didn't want to mess with his own bike I get it I understand I'm a fairly astute person when it comes to mechanics, but do I want to fix a transmission in my car or whatever? No. Only reason is I could be doing something else that actually benefits Brock's performance and make money and spend that money having an expert fix it. Well, unfortunately, most of our dealerships have gone out of business and this bike has been running poorly now for quite some time. He wasn't able to... Uh, he wasn't able to get it figured out, so I told him I'd help him out. We don't fix broke bikes, but he's a good friend. That's why we just left my house. I have to do this stuff on the weekends and at night and stuff, because I got Brock's performance to run during the day. So anyway, his first complaint was that the bike starts to miss. Now, Scott will be the first to tell you. He's, he cruises on this bike. He said the, the fastest he's ever really gone is probably 150. He said it scared him to death. If you, see, if you see his license plate, it says scary. He's not kidding. He's not built for that. He's a car dude. Car dudes don't seem to like to go real fast on motorcycles sometimes. But we can't have his bike missing. And I guess it got to the point where really he couldn't even cruise around on it. So I've already done a little bit of work on it. We'll get into that in more detail when we go to fix it. But for right now, we'll tell you, I replaced the fuel pump because I thought that's what it was. That's not what it was. Although the mist did move, so I'm not saying the fuel pump wasn't related. But I want to show you what this bike does. And the reason I want to bring this up is because these older, these are like the first generation fuel injected bikes, right? I think, uh, I think Suzuki, they, they first came out with them in 98, 99, I think. I first saw them in 99, but they're brutally simple. They don't measure a bunch of crap there. They're, they're basically like an electronic carburetor, if that makes any sense. And they're, and they're really simple, which means sometimes you can have problems and the ECU doesn't tell you exactly what's wrong, like today's ECUs do. So. I'm going to get to a point up here where I'm going to turn and then I'll show you what the problem is with the spike and we'll see if you guys can figure out what it is. Now before I do anything, I got to tell you, there's no electronics on this bike. We pulled off the power commander, 
uh, whenever you have a problem with a mist, take everything off the bike. I don't even, I don't care if it's a radar detector. If it didn't come on the bike, bone stock and it's electronic, take it off. So all you're dealing with is the stock bike. Now I'm gonna get away from these houses a little bit because in order to do what I need to do, I sort of need to sound like a little bit of a booty. All right, so what I'm gonna do, hopefully you can see the tack. I'm gonna gently rev this bike up to 8,000 RPM and watch what happens. You hear that? We are making fireworks, we're shooting ducks, and it will not, I can floor it, it will not go past that. Talk about annoying, and it doesn't really matter what gear you're in. You, you just go faster when it starts acting foolish like we are now. So, what would you do? Well, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and get this thing back to my, my shop at home, get it up on the lift, and we'll discuss what you guys think is wrong with this motorcycle. Now, it's really consistent. There's a little bit of a miss at 7,500. 8,000, it starts missing dramatically, and you can go wide open throttle, and it will not pull past that 8,000. Maybe it'll go 82 or 8,300. Oh, hell, I don't know. I was watching the road. Because even screwing up these bikes are unbelievably fast. <laughs> so I need to keep my eyes on the road. But anyway, while I'm trying to make it back to my shop, let's talk about the Hayabusa. I've, I've got a little different perspective on it than other people do. Most people, when a new bike comes out, you know, they hear about it in the magazine or they go to the dealership and, you know, they ask the sales guy, hey, what's up with this? What's up with that? Well, it just so happened that I developed a relationship with American Suzuki and they helped sponsor my drag race program starting in late 1988, 1999. Now, I was racing. 600 super sport and pro super bike those are both stories of their own but the reason i mention this is we were at actually in daytona for bike week in 99 and i'd been hearing rumors one of my buddies uh worked at a suzuki dealership uh spaceport down in florida and he's like brock did you hear about the new uh the new bike that Suzuki's coming out with. It's supposed to make all other bikes obsolete. I'm like, no, what, what's it called? I don't know, Hi, uh, Hiya something? It's something about some bird that goes 200 miles an hour. They claim the bike will go 200 miles an hour. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it sounds, sounds like a pipe dream. The reason I say that is because Suzuki has always been notorious for being very cautious. They built an amazing engine but they would do all kinds of things to keep them slow and calm. But if you were in the after work at world like I was, I guess I still am, but at the time, we would try to figure these things out because you could go by, at the time, the, the fastest bike on the road was a ZX-11. And uh, we could take a GSXR, even like an earlier model, a 90, 89, 90, the earlier ones, and once we got them working correctly, they would outrun a ZX-11 at the drag strip. Now, maybe not top speed, and, and no one in Japan cares about drag racing. Don't fool yourself. They, they do not care. Kawasaki is the closest one to caring. Suzuki doesn't care other than they sold a whole lot of motorcycles for drag racing, but I'm pretty sure they don't really understand why. Anyway, so once you would get the Suzukis figured out, you could make them really run and a, and a great example of that i remember when they uh, we called them the water water pumpers i remember when those bikes first came out in 1994 from suzuki i took one down the track i had it lowered i had it re-geared i had everything done to it and uh this thing was a mutt yeah i mean it man like 1050s I, I went faster on my 600. so i'm like well suzuki provided us with another another pooch well then one of my buddies down in florida scotty jones he liked the way the bike looked and he took it a little bit further and one of the things that he did is he put a set of kian or kahin however you want to pronounce them carburetors on his water pumper and i was down at daytona that this same it wasn't that trip this was a later one but he let me ride that bike and i couldn't believe it 
how much it picked up with carburetors. That bike went from 1050s to 970s swapping carburetors. I never would have believed it. But anyway, that's what Suzuki would do. So when I heard that they were going to come out with a really fast motorcycle off the showroom floor, I was skeptical. So I talked to my, uh, I called him my boss, Jeff Wilson, worked at Suzuki, wonderful guy. One of, the, one of the best people I've ever worked with in the corporate world. He's a good dude. Anyway, I asked him, I said, Jeff, what about this new, this new bike everybody's talking about? What, is it for real? He goes, oh yeah, it's for real. I'm like, how do you know? He goes, I rode one. I'm like, no shit. Tell me about it. And he said, well, he said, I, I got to ride one of the pre-production prototypes in, uh, in the desert. Just from California, Suzuki's in California. You can see how put the, put those puzzles piece of the puzzle together. And he said, so we took this pre-production bike out, uh, went to a dealership, borrowed a uh, ZX11, and me and a good friend of mine went out, just went out riding. No big deal. So apparently, in the California desert, there's also a section known as Mexico where they were doing roll-ons with the Hayabusa versus the ZX-11, both of them bone stock. Except at the time, the ZX-11 was touted as the fastest motorcycle in the world. Ask any motorcycle magazine, they tell you. Well, they were going out and doing roll-ons, and I said, so what, what happened? He goes, I don't really know how to explain it, Brock. He said, I'll try this. He said, you know, if you if you had a 600 and your buddy had a 750 and they're both late model same year modern day bikes he said if you go out for a ride that 750 because of the additional displacement and some additional technological advances is just going to walk away from that 600 it's it's not going to be a race now if you're going around corners that's a different thing but when it comes to straight line power it, displacement is king aerodynamics are king and he said brock he said that Hayabusa pulled away from a ZX-11 like a 750 pulls away from a 600. It is just not a race. And I said, holy cow, really? I'm, and he's like, yeah, but that's not, that's not it. He said, the aerodynamics on the bike, they spent a lot of time in the wind tunnel. And he said, you get down on the gas tank and get behind the fairing. He's like, it gets really quiet. It's like another world. And he said, the only thing that you really know, only really reason you know you're going fast is to look at the speedometer because it's so smooth and it's so fast, the speed creeps up on you. And the next thing you know, you're going, you know, you're accidentally going 150 or 160 miles an hour. I'm like, wait a minute, you're telling me you're accident. He, I, I promise you, he said, I thought I was maybe going 100, 110. He said, I looked down, I was going 160, and this thing was not even thinking about slowing down. He said, it's it's legit, it's badass. I'm like, I want one. Problem is, I don't have any money. <laughs> and he said, well, we'll see what we can do about that. You need to go fast on the 600 and 750. So anyway, the, my, the first time I laid eyes on a brand new Hayabusa, uh, an acquaintance of mine, Joel, Came rolling up one day on, I, I got a knock at the door of my house, and I see Joel, he's got his sunglasses up on top of his head, his hair is windblown like nothing you've ever seen, and he said, Brock, he said, you got to come out and look at my new toy. So I walked out the door, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. I looked out there, and he had one of the original, some people call them champagne, some people call them gold whatever that color was that Suzuki came up with that, that they decided make the bike made the bike look distinctive and I looked at that thing and I said oh my god that is the ugliest motorcycle I've ever seen in my life and listen you got to understand I, I used I had an 82 Katana and that was a love-hate right you either loved the way those bikes looks or you hated the way those bikes look and I gotta tell you I took one look at that Busa and especially with all that gold and all that pain, I'm like, God, it looks huge. It's, it's got to be heavy. I'm like, it reminds me sort of like a Blackbird-ish kind of thing. I'm like, there's, there's no way this thing's fast. And, and he, Joel hands me the keys and 
he goes just go take it for a ride and uh so i i gear up i always gear up <laughs> i've been down on one of these things it's no fun but i geared up and i took that thing out for a ride and at the time i lived really close to uh close to an interstate so i merged onto the interstate and i remember as soon as i twisted on that gas i mean this thing took off like a rocket there's no waiting for the power. It doesn't matter if you're going 2,000 RPM on one of these bikes. You twist on the gas, it starts moving forward. So I pulled out into traffic way too fast. Uh, whoa, I need to keep an eye on this stuff. And just about that time, I saw an opening. And man, I, I twisted the gas on that thing. And that, that ugly duckling, the ugliest motorcycle I'd ever seen in my life, all of a sudden became the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life. I remember the getting out and I, I, I ran it up through maybe fourth or fifth gear, which is which is solidly fast on one of these motorcycles, right? And I pulled in on the clutch and coasted, you know, like it was a drag strip run or something. And I, as I was slowing down, I remember thinking, wow, everything I have in my garage right now, everything that I'm working on, is obsolete it's obsolete this bike turns does it stop real well no the gen ones didn't really stop too well but boy would they go the aerodynamics were amazing unbelievably smooth i just absolutely instantly fell in love with that bike so <laughs> i told joel i'm like listen we gotta go to our local track kill care on thir on uh, thursday or maybe it was wednesday back then for a tuning test i'm like we got to take this thing down the track and he's like i was hoping you'd say that i want to see what it'll do so we get the thing set up and i take it out and i'm telling you my joy and smile and everything i loved about that motorcycle turned into a frustrating night of what the hell is wrong with this thing this was suzuki's uh they put a oh i guess you could sort of call it a slipper clutch i guess you could sort of call it a speed assist clutch because it it was supposed to help when you went faster keep the clutch from slipping all i know is that this motorcycle would not leave the starting line and i mean it was frustrating nothing i did as soon as i let the clutch out it made me look like i didn't know how to ride a motorcycle and it was like i said really frustrating because i know how to ride a motorcycle i did back then my god i was sponsored by american suzuki to drag race and I could not get that thing in the nines. So I told him, I'm like, man, I said, you got to bring this thing over to my house. I got to look at the clutch and see what's wrong with this thing. And I quit my mechanical design engineering job in 1998 to go race motorcycles. And I'm not sure if you guys have ever done that, but when you do, they stop paying you. <laughs> it becomes one of your concerns. Well, I figured out what's up with this Hayabusa clutch. I built a fixture. I started welding this little two-piece, people called them slippers, maybe they're slippers, I don't know what they are. I started welding these things together and the next thing you know, I've developed a business. I'm getting 10, 15, 20 of these things in a day to weld up. I fed my family for two years. <laughs> Rock's performance didn't really exist then. It was just something I did out of my garage. I certainly wasn't making any money with it. I could only spend money doing it. So anyway, we got the bike sorted out and we took it back to the track and I ended up buying a crashed one from uh, Jeff Wilson and I fixed it up and my Gen 1, I could go out and with good gas tuned up and slammed and prep like our boost of slam and prep articles, I could run 930s on the thing. Well up to then, if I wanted to go 930s, I had to spend a ton of money, big bore kit, cams, engine reliability would typically go out the window or close to it that's one thing the kawasaki's once you got out of about a 10 percent window on the older kawasaki's especially they just wanted to blow up i tried to make a zx11 fast and i could make it fast for a minute but then it'd throw a rod or do something stupid one of the things that we realized about these boosts was that they put a tremendous amount of work into the engine it was the best engine we'd ever seen I had a friend take one, turbocharge it, and this was in 1999. Bike made 400 horsepower, and I mean, he brutally reliable, 
It's like, wow, these, these, these Suzuki, these new engines are the real deal. And sort of the rest is history. I mean, the, the Busa really did change the landscape of all forms of sport bike drag racing. And in fact, you know, it moved up to where Back at, the, back at the time, I was trying to get in the sevens on my nitrous oxide bandit that took a ton of work. And, you know, you could take one of these, you could take one of these Hayabusa's and turbocharge them and damn, they were almost, they were damn near running with my bandit the first year. That's why we just had to, at one point, just had to say, listen, man, you, we got to get rid of all the rest of this stuff. It's nostalgic and we love it and we're glad it was here. But the boost has taken over. And really, the rest is history. They had a they had a 20 year run in the big bike business. The only one, only people that have even challenged them, my opinion, is uh, Kawasaki. The ZX14R, apples to apples, is a is a is a faster motorcycle. But it, the boosters are almost like a small block Chevy. They've got such a huge aftermarket following. I mean, we used to sell parts for these things to wear. A relatively decent wrench could pick up an easy 20 horsepower in an evening and if you wanted to spend an entire weekend you could pick up 40 horsepower go street ride and not hamper your reliability one bit I mean just a tremendous tremendous bike now it's it got a little bit long in the tooth they stopped making them in 2020 they have a new 2022 version coming out which We'll be doing some more on it, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and get this bike back in my shop and talk to you about what we just saw and talk to you about a couple of the other things that I found that are wrong with this bike, and then I'm going to show you how we're going to fix them. And this, this is important, guys. I'm talking about a Gen 1 Hayabusa, but all of the early model Suzukis were wonderfully stupid like this, and I mean GSXRs. I've seen GSXRs with the same problem this bike has for various different reasons um even even the hayabusas up till you know 06 07 08 we started not ha seeing so many problems um the 08 boosa was a big step up from the gen 1 as far as that kind of stuff goes and details go but enough rambling i am going to go ahead and get this thing in my shop and we will talk about what's wrong and what to do about it all right well that was fun um Beautiful Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> I'm in here in my home shop working alone instead of hanging out and drinking beer with all my party and friends. But <laughs> if you guys would have scored a little higher on how to succeed in the motorcycle world, which no one seemed to care about on our uh, on our poll, I I discussed that. Otherwise, ah, just a bunch of boring business stuff. All right. So I promised we would talk about what we had done previously to this bike. What direction we've gone in, how we're going to troubleshoot this the correct way. And also, I'm going to go ahead and show you how I do things because it's a little bit different than what you're going to see at a typical bike shop or whatever. I spent a lot of time in the past building engines. And one of the things that I can tell you is the customer is going to have questions later. And I mean, if you're like me, after so many years, it's like, oh, geez, so, you know, I think I remember, but I'd rather just sort of write it down. So I'm going to show you how we do that. Uh, anyway, if you saw our 40th anniversary uh, video before this one, uh, the gentleman who our, our creative services genius, Corey, can't be here. So I am going to shoot this video by myself with cool stuff. I am going to actually take the, take the helm here and sort of show you what we're dealing with. Um, I'll be setting this up for some of the closer shots, but what I wanted to talk about are some of the tools that are required for what we're gonna do. Now, a lot of people will have, oh, damn, what is all that stuff, Rock? And, and some people will be like, good, we're finally starting to get into some technical stuff. So number one, I don't care who you are, I don't care how much experience you think you have the OEM service manual. I drug this one up from 1999, um, which also happens to include uh, a printed copy of the Microfish. You can see, very, 
very well worn, uh, but you need the OEM service manual. Uh, you can get an aftermarket, you can get one online if you don't have any other choice, you don't have the means to purchase one of these. these they, uh, some of them you can find free PDFs, some of them you can't, so anyway, you will need that. What else do we have here? Uh, we have a leak down tester. Um, one of the things that I really hate is fixing a motorcycle in one area to find out it's completely broken in another. I just wasted all my time. That's what I mean by documenting what's going on here. We're going to actually check. We're going to get a reference check on the condition of this engine and figure out you know, is the problem that I think it has the only one or does it have more? And if so, should those be addressed? Uh, so we're going to need a leak tester. We're also going to do a compression test. Uh, unfortunately, on these late model sport bikes, most of the stuff's from the car world and it won't fit. So I, I found a 10 millimeter adapter that'll go into the Hayabusa. You can see where I had to machine a little bit off because it it wouldn't fit in the uh, in the cylinder head cavity where the spark plug goes, so I had to make some changes there. Um, a degree wheel. What the heck are we gonna do with that to find out why a bike's missing? Um, and then various tools. Uh, I use the positive stop method to find top dead center. What is that? Well, you can buy them. This is an old style that I bought, or you can make them. I tore up a spark plug. I drilled it. I tapped it. Uh, this is actually the one that I use for the Hayabusa's and have forever. This is all one I had laying around. Um, and you're going to need a dial indicator. So, first thing we did. <laughs> Usually what happens is I get a phone call and, say, and the customer says, Brock, my, my bike's missing. I need a new mat. All right. So, that's not how this works. So, just, just so we're clear on this. I went ahead and pulled this off the bike because that's part of a our troubleshooting process but you can see it's dirty uh, something has rubbed on it real good here my guess is the tire I'll show you where it was mounted so there's a decent chance that this unit could be faulty assuming it got wet that's about the only thing that kills them what most people don't realize is your bike has no idea that this is there the signals are coming from the ECU they come from the ECU into a harness into the injectors all we do is unplug the harness put this in, the, in line and it intercepts the signals, gives it more or less current voltage, boils down to fuel and duty cycle, but that turns into a long discussion too. Anyway, but it adjusts the fuel. So if you take this off the bike, what's gonna happen? Okay, your drivability is gonna suffer. You might lose a few horsepower, but it's not the end of the world. The bike came without it. It damn sure doesn't need it there when you're troubleshooting. Um, we have a list of things. Put a map in it. Does, does it work? We did that. It didn't make any difference. It still missed. So then, you know, pull the power commander completely off the bike. I pulled it off. I went for a ride. The mist was still there. The other thing that we're going to need, and I'll, and I'll get to that here in a minute because I know we're doing an awful lot of talking and not much doing. I need a paper clip. And this, I just took an old paper clip and straightened it up. And I, because I want to put this bike in dealer mode because modern fuel injected bikes. Sorry, I'll put you back here. Modern fuel injected motorcycles have self-diagnostics. That's one of the reasons you need the manual also because you need to know what the codes mean. But how do you get to the codes? I'm gonna show you how to do that now. I'm gonna set up another camera so you can see exactly what we're doing and we are gonna put this thing in dealer mode. Okay, first we're gonna access the seat um, on the Hayabusa's. A lot of guys use just a quick disconnect pin right in here. So makes it easy. There's a lot of easy stuff on these bikes. And then, um, so the first thing we have to do is find the dealer connector. Well, this one's been accessed before, so I left it here. A lot of times you have to get it out of this, the very back section here, which means you gotta pull off that side panel. We're lucky enough, we don't have to worry about that. So what I'm gonna do, now Suzuki sells a cool little switch and a plug-in and all that kind of stuff. You can buy one of those, or you can recognize that this is an older bike the dealer mode selector only has two wires so all we have to do and and i'm let me grab the other camera all right so if i look at the dash right now you can see this is this is what i get i set this down and then come over here and basically you can see where the two wires are i'm just going to take my jumper 
jump it across, and watch what happens on the dashboard. All right. So now, look at the dash. It says C00. What does C00 mean? C00 means no codes, no malfunction, no defective parts. So whatever's wrong with this bike, the motorcycle itself isn't giving, any, giving us any help. One thing I wanna to mention too, these bikes are pretty sen uh, sensitive to the throttle position. See the little dash by the C? If I give the bike gas, wide open throttle, it goes up. When I release the gas, I want it in the middle. There it goes to the middle. If the TPS wasn't adjusted correctly, it would have gone to the lower notch or stayed up top, and we would have needed to adjust the TPS to fix that. So this bike seems to be working good in that department, so that tells us we've got to look elsewhere. Now, what does elsewhere mean? Well, um, as I told you previously, we, we looked at mapping, we looked at this, we looked at that. Hey, you know, it's a motorcycle, change the spark plugs. Also, anytime you have any kind of miss, you're always gonna start looking at the, at the ignition, but in reality, a bad battery can cause you all kinds of trouble. And I, I'm gonna say this a lot. The batteries we get today just are not the same quality as the batteries we used to get. They go, they go bad quicker, they don't last as long, they don't have enough cranking amperage, blah, 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 blah. Um, I just put a regular old lead acid I had laying around here, but what I'm gonna do now, I'm going to take this battery out. Now it's not because when I'm working on the bike, I'm worried I'm gonna damage something. It's because I know that I have a habit of laying tools places, and I don't know if you've ever laid uh, like a wrench across the plus and negative terminals here, but boy, not only will it spark, it can cause an explosion. How do I know? Well, this ceiling is pristine. The ceiling at my old place actually had plastic embedded in it where a spark across these caused the battery, the sulfuric acid uh, must have had a, just a little invisible cloud of the stuff above it, and it, it ignited those fumes and the, it sounded like a gunshot, battery flew everywhere. Um, luckily, I had just moved my head so I didn't get acid in my face or plastic parts. But anyway, we're gonna take this off and just as a matter of good measure, throw it on the charger because there's also nothing more frustrating than fixing a motorcycle to find out that the battery's dead. Yeah. All right, let me put this stuff back. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start taking this out. Go ahead and pull the negative terminal off first. Stick my, my screw back in there so I don't lose it. Then pull off the positive. All right. All right, we've got it on the charger. I bought this old thing a long time ago at Walmart, I believe, and uh, this works great. It works on regular lead acid batteries, it works on lithium batteries, and it, and it was pretty inexpensive. It served me well over the years, so. All right, so now the next thing we're gonna do, I'm going to, <laughs> remember, these bikes, are, these bikes are a little old, so what I'm gonna have to do, actually, let me put this here. All right. So these bikes are sort of old and the fuel system on them isn't exactly modernized. Now, this is a 2000. It had an external fuel pump, which we'll show you here in a minute. But first, I need to get all the body work off. I need to get the gas tank off. I'm gonna use my, uh, my gas tapper. We sell them at Brock's Performance. This isn't a commercial, this is a great thing. These things, they, drain, they help drain the fuel out. Plus they come in a real nice case that are sealed off from the fumes because you're always gonna have fumes in the lines. That way, when you seal this thing back up, put it in your toolbox, your trailer, your truck, your van, whatever you use, uh, you don't have to smell the fumes all the time. So I'm gonna go ahead, drain the fuel. I'll show you one little thing on this bike that's sort of a pain and uh, then we'll just keep on going with what we're looking for. So this is important to note. Um, just like the batteries aren't the same quality they used to be, Neither is the fuel. I've already changed fuel in this. This is one of the first things that we checked along with changing the plugs. But there's so much ethanol and 
crap for emissions these days, it'll evaporate out of your fuel. And this bike sometimes will sit for months at a time. So once it started running bad, get the fuel out of there. It didn't make any difference, but now we have to get the fuel out so that we can start digging deeper into our problem. So the gas tapper is actually made for your car. So it has a 12 volt plug and a switch. You can have a battery, you can do whatever. I just have a cheap, cheap little inverter here to give me my 12 volts. And then they make it real simple for you. There's actually a little weighted end to this that goes down in the gas tank. Once I get it all un uncurled, you can see that. Uh, so obviously the other end will go into the pump. Now, no matter what, whenever we mess with this stuff, I keep a quickie little fire extinguisher handy. And I'm gonna go ahead and get the big one since we're dealing with this stuff directly. We got Big Bertha here just in case we have a, have a problem. Don't ask me why I need to do this. Dustin Clark, if you're watching, tell them why I gotta keep a fire extinguisher handy when we work on bikes. All right, here we go. All right, we got flow. We know we're not running the pump dry. I don't think there's a whole lot of fuel in here. So hopefully this won't take too long. While we're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and take off the tank bolts. Sort of multitask here. If you've never owned a Hayabusa, you would be absolutely amazed at how simple and fast it is to get to the engine on these bikes. They're just, they're very simple and very well engineered. And there are a whole lot of motorcycles out there that just do not have that same claim to fame. All right, looks like we're starting to run our little dry up. All right, keep this running, sort of bring that in. All right, now come over here, get rid of the power. I do not like having power around while I'm messing with fuel. We'll just set this aside. All right, here we have the handiest tool ever. Thank you, Suzuki. The tank is hinged. We're just gonna raise it up and boom. Now the gas tank is up. Now, I'm gonna have to, s actually, let me get this. All right, let me show you what we're dealing with here now. As mentioned, this is, this is one of the first year bikes, so Second year, I guess. So you can see it's got a petcock, but there's no on off valve on it. And then it's also got a return because the fuel pump is external. Now I'm going to take these off, but one of the things I know to do, I'm going to just go ahead and take some hemostats and block the, and block these hoses off because when I pull them off, it's usually more of a problem if you don't suck the gas out first, but otherwise you, you basically get a gas bath. And one of the things you really got to watch is to keep uh, keep something handy to cap this nipple. And then once I get that undone, we'll pull the tank apart and pull it completely off the bike. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and, and pull the gas or try to get the gas tank sealed up here. Now, what I want you to notice, you've got two lines because this constantly recirculating system. So the tools we're gonna use, I've got some little needle nose curve pliers that help getting the pinch clamps off, hemostats to pinch off the fuel line to keep, uh, keep stuff from, you know, gas from getting all over. I got a 10 millimeter um, vacuum cap and an eight millimeter vacuum cap. Now, if you own the original bike, there's two of these under your tail section. This bike had been modified. It's got a, uh, oh, it's got an aluminum plate back there, tail tidy, I guess you'd call it. So I had to use these just, this is hardware store stuff, guys. It's easy. And then, of course, we're going to want to put a, a rag down there because since the fuel pump is external, it's pretty hard to take it off without making a mess. First thing we'll do, there's just two lines or two wires hooking up the, the uh, fuel gauge. 
we'll disconnect those. We'll go ahead and just stick our rag down in here to catch anything. I'm going to go ahead. Now these springs are real important. You definitely want to run these springs on the bike. They're a little bit of a pain when you're working on it, but I'm just going to move that back, clamp that off, and now I'm going to come in here. Because we already drained the gas out, I shouldn't have to worry about fuel jumping out of the top nipple there. All right, scoot that down, pull off that top line. All right, no fuel, that's nice. Gonna do the same thing, go ahead and pull this hemostat off. Now, sometimes you might have to use two sets of hemostats because fuel can come in, go through the pump and come out, but it looks like we got it drained out well enough. So I'm just gonna pinch off this lower line now. Pull it back. All right, okay, no fuel dripping. But we have to pull off the tank and get it off the bike. So I put my vacuum cap on the lower one, the 10 millimeters on. All right. The eight millimeter is now on. Tank's unplugged. Let me see if I can take this off. Yep, all right. No, uh, really don't have any fuel leaking there. So now I'm gonna remove this bolt, that bolt, and this little gadget here is your tip over sensor. If you forget to plug this in, your bike will start for a second and turn off. Start, turn off, or if you forget to unbolt it. Uh, anyway, this, this is the wire right here to undo that. So I'm just going to take these off real quick and get this tank off and uh, so we can see what we're working with. All right, I just unplugged the tip over sensor. I need a 12 millimeter. Holy cow. G.I. Joe with a Kung Fu grip, put that on. All right, I did remember, I just saw them here. There are some additional drain lines down here at the bottom. I'm gonna to wanna to pull off before I try and pull up this, pull up this tank. those out. All right. So now what do we have? We have the air box and there's the fuel pump that was recently replaced. Didn't matter. What I'm going to do is set the cameras up here so we can go ahead and pull off the fuel box or the uh, air box and then we're going to discuss what I think is wrong with this bike but before we do that I went on a ride and I noticed something I want to show you how to fix it real quick so let's do that first all right let's get down to this before my last ride I flicked the kickstand up and then my my foot touched the the side stand accidentally and knocked it down and the bike turned off well think about this if you're going down the road and you hit a bump and your kickstand stays down. See this switch? As soon as that switch extends, your bike turns off. And it doesn't have to extend very far if it moves hardly at all. Well, the problem we've got here, look how tight this is. This is no good. And nine times out of 10 when this happens, it's because this, so you've got a bolt that screws in from the back and this part's threaded. Okay, so that's what holds the kickstand on. This nut, all, its only job is to keep that bolt from falling out. And generally what happens is you either get chain lube, gook, or whatever that causes this problem, or this bolt's too tight. I have a feeling that that's what it is, so I'm gonna grab a, uh, I'm gonna grab a wrench real quick and we can see if we can make this work. Now, one thing I will point out, on race bikes, we take this switch, we unplug it from the harness, and then where it is at the harness, we just tie them together. You know, if we leave our kickstand down, we're dipshits and deserve to go down, or that, that's not very nice, but we know to pull up our kickstand. So this is a nice safety feature for the street. 
Um, but I've also seen a lot of money lost on the street because these side stand switches fail. So we take them off on anything that's really important. Let me go grab some tools, I'll be right back. All right, guys, let me see what we've got here. Um, this is a just in case that it's not a bolt issue. Let me see, if, see how tight this is. It's definitely tight. For whatever reason, this tab is bent. Oh, I see. Wow, that is not at all how that's supposed to be. This tab should be flat faced up against this plunger. So I'm gonna just bend it up. All right, now let's try this again. Ready, tidy, lefty, loosey. All right, so the nut is now broken loose. But look, we have the same, we have the same issue. So, and in fact, if you look, this thing is really wallered out. <laughs> so I think a lot of our problem is either the springs could be bad or going bad, or maybe they got sprung when the, the chrome kickstand was installed or it's just gunk. Let me see if I can put a little penetrating oil in here. And the biggest thing is, you just want this to come up really no matter what. And it's not, it's really not doing it. Yeah, see how it's, it's still, still pretty stuck here for some reason. So what, what that tells me is we're going to have to replace these, uh, we're going to have to replace these springs, but at least we know it's something that we need to address because you can't, you can't have that. You can't have your side stand and it has to really be pulled up against the stop in order to work correctly. Uh, this alt bracket also might be worn out. This thing's moving an awfully lot. So... We'll have to deal with this later, but we'll keep that on our, our list of things to watch because if you're, you're having a problem with your bike missing and he said when he was riding it before, it has just cut off before and turned back on, I promise you it's this. So we'll address that. This, once we get the body work off, um, we'll figure out exactly what's happening with this thing. And, uh, but anyway, let me uh, start working on that body work. This body work really comes off fairly simply. There's a little rubber grommet here. If you pull this up, pull this back. Hi, Abusas. I don't want to forget. You always have to watch on these things. They will scratch the hell out of the body work. Alright, set this someplace safe for now. Alright, same deal. Pull that up. Up and out. And then that's out of the way. Okay. We are looking more and more like a motorcycle that we're getting ready to work on. So, let's stop here for a second and regroup. I will be back in a minute with a couple questions for you. Okay, let's stop and reflect here for a second. <clears throat> Previously, when we had the problem with the bike, we changed the spark plugs. Sometimes knowledge is a bit of a curse. When, he, when uh, Scott was describing to me the miss and the consistency of the miss and how he couldn't go any faster, I figured it was the fuel pump. Nine times out of 10, it's the fuel pump. Well, I replaced the fuel pump, it did exactly the same thing. So we removed the power commander, the plugs have already been changed, we changed the battery, we changed the fuel pump, and the, and the problem persists. Well, I have a feeling I know what it is and we're gonna dig into this together. I could be wrong, uh, I was wrong on the fuel pump. <laughs> so, yeah, but I told him, with 25,000 miles, especially what on, on the 99 and 2000 Hayabusa's, because the fuel pump is external, they had a tendency to go bad quite frequently. So with 25,000 miles, I'm like, dude, you're gonna end up, if you don't replace it now, you're gonna replace it any later. So let's just go ahead and get it out of the way. We got that out of the way and the bike is still having the problem. But here's a little asterisk of something that 
I noticed when I was replacing the fuel pump that made me go, uh oh, I have a feeling I know what's up. Let's stop right there and you guys tell me what you think the problem is. Do, 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 Okay, enough of that. I am going to show you what I saw when I was replacing the fuel pump. Let's just come on over. So here's the fuel pump I replaced. I was down here minding my own business. And what do I see? It's in this image right now. Can you guys see what, what set off a little uh-oh flag in my head? What's that? I'll tell you what that is. That is a manual cam chain tensioner. So why would I think uh-oh with a manual cam chain tensioner? Well, it's simple. Manual cam chain tensioners are incredibly reliable in race applications. The problem with street applications are manual cam chain tensioners need to be frequently adjusted. Now, you see the bike, pretty dirty, power commanders all gooked up, there's crap everywhere, all kinds of dirt, debris. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the manual cam chain tensioner in this bike was not continually adjusted uh, or maintained. So what does that mean? Well, a couple things can happen. If the cam chain tensioner was uh, initially installed and tight, it can cause the cam chain to stretch. Of course, cam chains will stretch over time naturally, so it's really not that uncommon to have some cam chain problems. The other problem is, if you do have cam chain tensioner or cam chain stretch, or the tensioner isn't isn't continually maintained and by continually i mean race race engines come out they come apart they're apart several times in a season so a bike with twenty five thousand miles on it how often do you, does the engine come out this engine has probably never been out of this bike so um it doesn't get constantly maintained so what can happen is your cam chain uh, uh tensioner uh the guides the cam chain guides can wear the cam chain can stretch and then one minute your bike's running fine, the next minute it starts running poorly. And when I say poorly, exactly what we saw in the video. Now this is, this is really big too. This is not exclusive to the Gen 1 Hayabusa. I have seen this in early model GSXRs, later model Hayabusas. What we, what we originally found was when we were building Hayabusa engines, one of the trends in the industry was to roll the intake cam way back instead of having a lobe center of let's say 105 or 107 something normal like a stock bike would have uh, some of the engine builders were moving the power cam timing is the same as velocity stacks it doesn't make power it moves power and a lot of times you can move power into the higher rpm range where you want to be if you're drag racing or land speed racing but on the street, it had a tendency to pull some mid-range away. Well, one of the things we noticed on these bikes is there's a window of operation between the degrees of crank crankshaft rotation and the cam position sensor on the intake cam. And if that cam chain stretches too much or if it jumps timing a tooth, now all of a sudden you've got the equivalent of rolling your intake cam way back, the bike's out of phase and it won't fire properly, but this ECU is so beautifully stupid, it won't tell us that that's what's wrong. Today's modern bikes, you take a BMW or an H2 or any of these late model things, oh my God, they, 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 give, they give you right an encyclopedia on all the crap that's going on that could be causing pro performance problems. But on these bikes and the early Gixxers, it was something that actually happened quite frequently. A friend of ours with a 2000, 2006 GSXR. He did a lot of street riding, a lot of track days. And the thing about track days are, you're constantly on the gas, off the gas, on the gas, off the gas. If somebody said to me, Brock, what's the best way to stretch a cam chain? I'd say that, exactly what I just said. On, off, on, off, on, off, downshift, stretch, whoa, just beat it to death. Well, he had to have his, he would have, he got to the point where every two years he would just replace his cam chain and have the cam timing uh, readjusted because he knew he was going to start getting into problems. So anyway, 
How can you tell if a bike has jumped cam timing? Well, I'm sort of old fashioned, show me. So I want to see that it's out of spec and then we'll address what we have to do with it. But first we have to prove that that's actually the problem. And we do that by popping off the air box and removing the valve cover. And that's where we will begin next time.